Last week we started a systematic study of the Bible. And we started studying from Genesis chapter 1. Genesis chapter 1. We read verses 1 to 25 last week. In verse 1 it says, In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. And that introduced us to the creation. And last week we saw a number of things. We said that Genesis is a Greek word for this first book of the Bible. And that the first five books of the Bible generally referred to in the New Testament as the law or the law of Moses but those um, five books are referred to by scholars as the Pentateuch that is the five books we also said that Genesis means beginning so the book of Genesis is the book of beginnings it tells us the beginning of the story or history of the um, man the beginning of all things it introduces us to the beginning of sin in the world it introduces us to the uh, first rebellion in the world it introduces us to a number of things that uh, just start a chain of events or teachings in the word of God. So every student of the Bible ought to know that Genesis means beginning and it is a book of beginnings. Then we also saw that Jesus Christ testified to uh, the validity or the truth of the Pentateuch all together that it is part of scripture and as being scripture it is inspired that means it is given by God himself then we saw very clearly that Moses was the man that God used to write down all the accounts we have in Genesis Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. And there is abundance of evidence in the scriptures, both in the Old and in the New, that actually it was Moses that God used. If people question you as to how did Moses know when he had not been born that's easy some critics feel that they have some questions for us to answer which they feel we cannot answer they feel if we say it was Moses who wrote Genesis why he was not yet born how could he do that well another thing you must realize that Moses did not only write about the past before he was born. He also wrote about the future after he was dead. For example, before he died, he spoke to the children of Israel. He said that they were going to be disobedient and that they were going to be dispersed, scattered all over the face of the earth. It had not happened at that time. It was still future. Yet he died. And it had not been fulfilled, but years later it came. It was fulfilled. It was Moses that wrote 
looking to the future, saying, A prophet shall God raise up among you like unto me, referring to Jesus Christ, who came thousands of years after Moses had died. So if Moses, by inspiration, could write about the future, things that will happen after his death, and all he wrote was correct about the future, then he could write about the past before he was born. We learned last week that the name of God used in Genesis chapter 1, where we have read, which says, In the beginning, God created. Then in verse 3, And God said. In verse 4, and God saw. Then in verse 5, and God called. Verse 6, and God said. Verse 7, and God made. Verse 8, and God called. Verse 9, and God said. Verse 10, and God called. Verse 11, and God said, and so on. The name that is used consistently for God in those passages or sentences is Elohim, E-L-O-H-I-M. El is the singular and it means the strong one, the mighty one, the one who is capable of doing anything and everything he decides to do. But Hebrew scholars tell us that the word Elohim is in the plural. That is, in the original, it means in the beginning, Elohim, the plural personalities in the Godhead created the heaven and the earth. So, even without studying Hebrew, you can see it very clearly in verse 26 of chapter 1. And God said, let us, if he had been the only one, he would have said, let me. But he said, let us, referring to the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost in Matthew chapter 3. We're reading from verse 14, Matthew chapter 3. Let's go back a step. Verse 13. Then cometh Jesus from Galilee. If you don't know who that Jesus is, he is the Son of the Most High. He is the Christ, the Anointed of God. He is the expected Messiah. He is the one referred to by the Father, saying, He is my beloved Son. And then, came, then comes Jesus from Galilee to Jordan, unto John, to be baptized of him. But John forbade him. That means John said no. Saying, I have need to be baptized of thee, and comest thou to me? And Jesus, answering, said unto him, Suffer it, allow it, permit it to be so now. For thus it becometh us to fulfill all righteousness. Then he suffered him, he allowed him, he permitted him. And Jesus marked this. And Jesus, when he was baptized, went up straightway, out of the water and lo the heavens opened unto him see that Jesus on earth his feet touching the ground but the heavens opened that's another place not earth heaven opened two different places and he saw the Spirit of God descending, that's in the firmament, as heaven, firmament, three, three places. Then Jesus on earth, God the Father in heaven, 
then the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of God, descending, passing through the air like a dove, and lightning upon him. And lo, from heaven, saying, lo, a voice from heaven, saying, this is my beloved son. You don't even need to pass through primary school to know that if somebody says, this is my son, his name must be called what? If somebody says, this is my son, the person talking, calling another person's son, his name is what? His name is Father. And if anybody claims to be saved, claims to be born again, and doesn't even know that, he's living in darkness. And lo, a voice from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. The Father spoke from heaven. The Son came out of the water, and the Holy Ghost lightened upon the Lord Jesus Christ, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Let us make man in our image. In Matthew chapter 28, from verse 19. Now I realize this, that Jesus Christ knows more about himself than I know about him. Don't you know that? Jesus Christ knows more about the Godhead than any religious fellow knows about the Godhead. This is a person who has gone, gone to heaven and has come back and has gone again. This is a person who was crucified and he died and he was buried, but on the third day he rose from the dead. This is a person who said, all authority and power is given unto me. This is a person who knows all things because he had been from the beginning, from the dateless past. Now in Matthew chapter 28 from verse 19. Go ye therefore, that's Jesus talking, and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the, of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Then, since we have never gone to heaven, the person who came from heaven should be allowed to talk. And he's talking. In um, Acts of the Apostles, chapter 7, I'm showing you that in the Godhead, the revelation of scripture is that we have the Father, the Son, and uh, the Holy Ghost. I've shown you in Matthew chapter 3. I have shown you in Matthew chapter 28. And the Bible says, out of the mouths of two or three witnesses, every word shall be established or confirmed. Now I'm reading Acts chapter 7. Acts of the Apostles chapter 7 from verse 55. And he being full of the Holy Ghost. That's on earth. Stephen was on earth. And he, Stephen, was full of the Holy Ghost. He looked up steadfastly into heaven and saw the glory of God. God. And Jesus standing on the right hand of God. Already we have the Father, that's God. We have the Son standing on the right hand of the Father. And we have the Holy Ghost feeling and saturating uh, Stephen. And then he said, Behold, I see the heavens opened. And the Son of Man standing on the right hand of God. Then they cried out with a loud voice and stopped their ears and ran upon him with one accord. They didn't want to hear about the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. They put their hands in their ears. There are people who hate sound doctrine. They hated it in the past, and there are those who still hate it today. And casting him out of the city, there are those who will throw their pastors who are teaching sound doctrine out of the church. And stoned him. And the witnesses laid down their clothes at a young man's feet, 
whose name was Saul, and he stoned Stephen, calling upon God and saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. So it is very clear from scripture. If anybody has ears to hear, the Bible says, let him hear what the spirit says unto the churches. And this is what the Lord is saying unto the churches, that the word that is used for God in Genesis is Elohim. And Elohim is in the plural. And it refers to the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost in the, benedic in the benediction, which is read at the end of the church service every Sunday in 2 Corinthians chapter 13. 2 Corinthians chapter 13. Verse 14. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, that's the Son of God, and the love of God, that's the Father, and the communion of the Holy Ghost, that the Holy Spirit, be with you all. Amen. Amen. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. So that is why consistently in the Old Testament, in fact, uh, scholars of the scriptures tell us that more than 2,000 times in the Old Testament, that Hebrew word Elohim uh, is used in um, the Old Testament for God. And yet scholars have pointed out that the word created, which is the verb, is in the singular, which means uh, um, the word Elohim is a uniplural noun. It is used in the plural because of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost, and yet they are one. They are one. That means that they are united. Then we are being told that um, according to the revelation of Scripture, the Father had his part in the work of creation, the Son had his part in the work of creation, and the Holy Spirit had his part in the work of creation. Last study, we also saw that it is God, not man. It is God, not the scientist, not the philosopher, and not Satan that created the heaven and the earth. Have you noticed that God created man last? Have you noticed that? If he created man on the first day, some people may think that man assisted God in making the world, creating the world. So God finished everything. He created the stars, the moon, the sun, the earth, the waters, the fishes, everything, all the moving creatures. After everything was in order, God is wise. He knew that some psychologists and some scientists and some people who are deceiving themselves, who, who still depend even on air before they can breathe, well, that makes man very small. What we depend upon, air, water and those two things if they are taken away from from you for one day that scientist is gone a scientist is not too great it's not very great after all in fact the bible says let me open that to you we're studying the bible today and we're going to refer to many verses job chapter 32 i'm telling you that scientists are not as great and as wise as uh, they feel and as they think in uh, my study, I came across this fact that the person who made a computer, if you know a computer, uh, that computer is a great machine. It can add figures together. It can do a number of things that uh, it appears the human brain may not be able to do as fast. But the man who discovered how to operate the computer couldn't keep his wife. He had to go for a divorce. I mean, a man who could not manage a home who cannot control a woman and yet made a computer. Scientists are small people, little people. In, in Job chapter 32, verse 9, great men are not always wise. Neither do the aged understand judgment. They don't understand. But we are here we have got the knowledge of the word of God 
because we say thus says the lord and anybody who says thus says the lord and he reads it out of the book of god is a wise person because he's borrowing and getting the wisdom of god he is not speaking out of a selfish personal carnal mind he is talking the word of god and paul the apostle said we speak wisdom among them that are perfect and so we see that in the word of God, it is God that created not man, nor the scientist, and not Satan. Then God released creative power through words. Whenever he said, let there be, it was. That is our God who we are told in Romans chapter 4 verse 17, who calleth those things which be not as though they were. And in Hebrews chapter 11 verse 3, we are told that by faith we understand that the walls were framed by the word of God. And in Peter we are told that this same word, by the word of God, is reserved unto fire. And seeing that all these things shall be dissolved, what manner of men ought ye to be in all holy conversation? The word of God is a powerful word. It's a creative word. And that is what Jesus manifested when he came to this world. You'll see that Jesus Christ manifested creative power. A blind man will come and say, Lord Jesus, I want to receive my sight. Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy on me. And then Jesus will say, what will thou that I should do unto you? And then he will say that I might receive my sight. And Jesus will say, all right, you've got it. That face makes you whole. And immediately he'll see. There was creative a power in his word. At other times, uh, there was a man with a withered hand in Mark chapter 3. And he told him, stretch it forth. He stretched it forth and it became whole as the other. In Mark chapter 2, we are told that a man was brought by four people. And he made a hole in the roof and dropped the man down. He said, thy sins be forgiven thee. The Pharisees and the scribes were wondering, who is this man that forgiveth sin? Because there is no man that can forgive sin but God. But he said that you may know that the Son of Man has power on earth to forgive sins. He said unto the man, arise and take up your bed and walk. And creative power went forth in his word and he walked. And in Mark chapter 4, we are told that he was in the sheep and there was a storm. And the disciples came unto him and they said, Master, carest thou not that we perish? And he rose up and again with power and authority, he said, Peace be still. And immediately there was a great calm. That's why you know and how you believe that Jesus had part in the creative work, uh, in, the, or in the original work that God made. There is creative power when um, God released that uh, through words. Then God in his wisdom made all necessary separation. He separated between light and darkness. And today God makes a separation between Christianity and Islam. He does. Today God makes separation between Christianity and cults. He does. Today God makes separation between the Bible and science. God is still making separation between knowledge and error. God makes separation between children of God who are children of the light and children of the devil who are children of the dark. And what God has put asunder, let no man join together. If God has separated light and darkness, keep it separated. When a believer goes to marry a non-believer, he is bringing together what God has separated. You will bring in confusion. So let's keep that right. Let's keep that straight. That a non-believer doesn't get into your life in marriage. If you are a believer. That a non-believer doesn't get into Christian work. Christian work is to, supposed to be done by children of the light. And darkness and light are still separated today. God examined the work at the end of each day. And we must learn wisdom from that. We must um, be taking inventory. That is, we must be looking back at every day's work. Driver, you look back. How did I drive today? Was I impatient? Impatience is carnality. Did I put the other drivers first? Examine how you drive. Messenger, examine how you did your work during the day. 
Was I rude? Was I impolite? Did I work well? Wife, examine your faithfulness to your husband. Did I do the right thing at the right time for my husband today? Husband, examine your, your love for your wife. Did I love my wife today as Christ loves the church? And you businessman, examine your work. Did anybody in our business, in our company give bribe today? Did anybody take a wrong step? Did we issue out any receipt? And did we try to buy something beyond and above our resources, our income? Are we um, employing more workers than we can pay? Think about what you are doing every day, every day. As an individual, think about your Christian life. Did I evangelize today? Did I pray today? Did I read the word of God today? Did I prepare for the second coming of the Lord for the rapture today? If the Lord were to come tonight, am I ready? Did I behave right to my fellow brother, to my fellow sister? Did I do right in fellowship with other people like God? Examine this work at the end of each day. Examine your work, spiritual work. Examine your work, household duties. If uh, more of our sisters will do that, laziness will be cut off from our lives. Sometimes to soak your clothes, and um, because you don't examine your work at the end of the day, the cloth is there. Second day, the cloth is still there. Third day, the cloth is still there. And um, that's a mark of laziness. Examine it. When you have eaten, now you understand that we need to be taught everything. Is that not so? Because if I didn't say these things, you may not hear it in any other place. And uh, God is bringing us here to teach us so that you can apply the word of God in your life and so that you can teach other people also. After eating, some people will pack their plates and just pack everything in the kitchen. Well, if we're going to follow after God, you will examine the kitchen. At the end of the day, have I put the gas off? You may look, we may think this, that's a small thing, but you can kill your children with that gas if you don't examine everything. After you finished cooking, after the day, check up. Have you washed the pots? Have you washed all the plates? When your clothes is dirty and you just put it on the, on the line, have I washed? Have I made myself clean? When you wake up in the morning and you want to go out, have you taken your bath? Check up everything. This is the thing that actually makes us to be followers of God. When in every detail, small or big, every detail, spiritual or physical, emotional or temperamental, we are giving everything over to God and we are examining everything to see if we are in line with the word of God. Then God's work was done systematically and orderly. We studied last week. He could have finished everything in one day, but he decided not to. Some people question us. You say that um, God saves and God heals. Yes, that's in the word of God. They ask, can't God heal and save? At the same time, he can, but generally he does not. Because he will only answer one prayer at a time. If you are praying for healing, when you pray through on that and you manifest faith, you are healed. Because that's the answer to the prayer you have prayed. He knows that you need other things. But if you have not asked, he will not give. Ye ask not because, or ye receive not because he ask not. You have not got because you have not asked. When you pray for salvation and you pray in faith, repenting of all your sins, he saves you. Some people ask. Can't God save and sanctify at the same time? He can, but he does not. His disciples, the disciples of Jesus were saved. And after some years, Jesus Christ prayed for their sanctification. God does all things decently and in order. He first of all saves before he sanctifies. Then he sanctifies before he baptizes in the Holy Ghost. He will make you put right your life before you become a counselor to put up to put right the lives of other people. That is just how God works. 
Today we are considering in a major way the creation of man. I'm reading now in Genesis chapter 1, verse 26, all through to verse 31. And God said, Let us make man in our image after our likeness. Now remember the one talking, that's God, the Almighty. And you know that it's in the plural here, let us make. That means the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost wanting to create man after God's image and after the likeness of God. We were not created after the likeness of Satan. We were not created after the likeness of animals. Some people waste a lot of time. And they waste a lot of money in scientific um, research. Trying to discover uh, which apes gave birth to our forefathers. But um, I think ordinary common sense, without even going to secondary school, she'll tell us that if some apes uh, gave birth to human beings 100 years ago, or even 1,000 years ago, some of those apes should still be giving birth to human beings right now. The apes are still in the zoo. And yet, since human beings have been observing them, ape will give birth to ape. Dog will produce dog. Sheep will produce sheep. Goat will produce goat. And human beings will produce human beings. And God said, Let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth so God created man in his own image so God created man in his own image in the image of God created he him male and female created he them who created the woman? God. Who created the woman? God. Remember that next time you feel tempted to just abuse and slap a girl as if uh, she was created by the devil. But only the men were created by God. Remember that God made and created male and female. Your wife was created by God. Your maid was created by God. And we ought not to speak anything derogatory against the creature of God. And God blessed them, that's verse 28, and uh, said unto them, Be fruitful and multiply and replenish, that word means fill up the earth. Fill up the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air. And over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. And God said, Behold, I have given you every herb bearing seed, which is upon the face of the earth, and every tree in the which is the fruit of a tree yielding seed. So uh, to you it shall be for meat, that means for food. Is it the will of God that we eat? Yes. Is it the will of God that we eat? Yes. So don't feel guilty for eating. Some people condemn themselves when they start eating. After taking two muscles, the devil speaks to them and says, Uh-huh, and you say you are a Christian and you are eating. And the person will stop a little bit and then take another muscle. And the devil will say, If you take that, you are disobeying God. If you take that, you are not actually saved. If you are saved, you are not three muscles already. And the person will wash his hand. And then uh, say, well, God doesn't allow me to eat. Not God, it's Satan. God has given us a gauge in our belly. And uh, when you are all right to the point it will nourish your body, that gauge will say it is enough. It is not the devil that will come and whisper in your ears, it is enough. It is your belly that will give you the signal, it is enough. Now, the Lord knows why we are saying that. You may say, you may think I'm plain, but God must have known there is somebody here tonight who is having that problem. That is why God has taught us that now. And in verse 30, and to every beast of the earth, 
and to every fowl of the air, and to every sin that creepeth upon theirs, wherein there is life. I have given every green herb for meat. And it was so. And God saw every sin that he had made. And behold, it was very good. And the evening and the morning were the sixth day. I'll come back to comment on those verses we have read in chapter 1. I want to point out something to you. Um, sometimes those who don't study the Bible are right. Uh, they have a number of uh, misconceptions about the record in the Bible. They say, look at it. It tells us that in chapter 1, God created man. But in chapter 2 again, it starts to talk about another creation. Now, which one is right? That's the question they ask. Both are right. Those who have studied journalism or Christian writing, or those who have studied the writing of books in any way, or if you have studied the writing of articles, you would have understood that there is something you call um, talking or giving out the climax or the conclusion right at the beginning in the first paragraph so that tells the person what we are writing about and that is what has happened in chapter one we are told about the creation of man how it was done we are not told in chapter one we are just told god made them male and female and he told them multiply fill up the earth and I've given you food. I've given you all provision. Then it comes to chapter 2. Telling us now this is the step God took. In creating Adam and creating Eve. So chapter 2 tells us the detail of what God actually did. Chapter 1 tells us the conclusion or the climax of God's creation. Now let us read chapter 2. Thus the heavens and the earth were finished, and all the hosts of them. And on the seventh day God ended his work, which he had made. And he rested on the seventh day from all his work, which he had made. And God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it. Because that in it, he had rested from all his work that God created and made. These are the generations of the heavens and of the earth when they were created in the day that the Lord God made the earth and the heavens and every plant of the field before it was in the earth and every herb of the field before it grew for the Lord God had not caused it to rain upon the earth and there was not a man to till the ground but there went up a mist from the earth and watered the whole face of the ground and the Lord God formed man this is the purpose this uh, chapter is written because in chapter one we were not told all these details we are now reading about we're just told in chapter one how the trees were made how the plants were made but now we are told how they continued to grow now in verse seven we are being told and the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground, of the dust of the ground, and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. This we have known from scientists who have observed what God did. Those who studied biology, I don't mean in the secondary school. The one you study in secondary school is just to give you a certificate to show that uh, they took you from your mother and your father and you attended something they call school. 
but I mean those who actually attended um, a higher school, higher institution, and they studied biology, they recognize that there are 16 elements or more in the soil, which is also discovered in the body of man. And this is what is written down in the word of God, that our body is made by uh, God and formed through the dust of the ground. And uh, everybody unconsciously knows this. You'll be watching people when an old man dies, when an old woman dies, when a young child dies, when anybody dies, what do they do? They don't read this verse, whether pagan or Muslim or Christian or religious fellow, what do they do? They go to the burial ground, 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 and then they dig and put that person there and then cover the person with mud. They said, that's where you came from, go back. They don't treat this. But there's something in them that knows that. That dust thou art, and unto dust thou shalt return in Ecclesiastes. Ecclesiastes is after Proverbs. From verse 1, remember, now that creator, in the days of thy youth, when the evil days come not, nor the years draw nigh, when thou shalt say, I have no pleasure in them, while the sun or the light or the moon or the stars be not darkened, nor the clouds return after the rain in the day when the keepers of the house shall, shall tremble, and the strong men shall bow themselves, and the grinders cease because they are few, and those that look out of the windows be darkened, and the doors that be shut uh, shall be shut in the streets when the sound of the grinding is low, and it shall rise up at the voice of the bed, and all the daughters of music shall, shall be brought low. And also when they shall be afraid of that which is high, and fear shall be in the way, and the almond tree shall flourish, and the grasshopper shall be a body, and the desire shall fail, because man goeth to his long home. And the mourners go about in the streets, that's talking about death, and or ever the silver cord be loosed, or the golden bowl uh, be broken, or the pitcher be broken at the fountain, or the wheel broken at the cistern, then, after death, then shall the dust return unto the earth as it was, and the spirit shall return unto God who gave it. So man was created from the dust of the ground. And uh, next time you feel proud because of your beauty, remember you are dust. Have you ever tried it? Even when you are taking your bath in the morning with the best soap in town, and just strike your finger on your hand, and you'll find dust coming out. And you are taking your bath. You know you are clean. And when you just put your hand like that on your body and you squeeze it very well, you find that dust will be coming out. Our God is greater than we are. And it doesn't matter who you are, you are dust. Sometimes you have um, a lady telling herself how beautiful I am. Actually, she is not beautiful except to herself and to anybody she has deceived. Uh, through the makeup. But um, after a few years, and you see the jaws all falling, and the cheek all collapsing, and the teeth all falling out, and the back bent, and all the face wrinkled, all the boys and the men that were running after her in those days, they see her, and she is not uh, up to one naira or ten naira in their sight anymore. I'm telling you, we human beings, we are small. We are small. We are little. Only children of God who are big on the inside because of a great God we are serving. Only those of us who are Christians have anything to rejoice about. If you are not a Christian, you now you tell me what is your joy. After a person has died and is buried, if he is not a Christian, he goes to hellfire. 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 And he will be burning forever and ever. 
and all the joy of seeing in those days. All the joy of wearing the best clothes, riding the best car, living in the biggest house in town, having the largest business, the most um, expanded business in town. All that is gone after the man is dead. For dust will return to dust and the spirit will go back to God. So we were made of the dust of the ground. And in chapter 2 of Genesis, I'm reading from verse 8. Chapter 2 of Genesis, reading from verse 8. And the Lord God planted a garden, eastward in Eden. And there he put the man whom he had formed. The Lord made a good place, Eden. Now as students of the Bible... There are some mistakes you never ought to make. Uh, in the past, I used not to say some of these things while I, while I teach. I feel that people will know, but sometimes I was listening to a cassette produced in America. And there were about uh, more than 20,000 people in that, um, in that meeting where the preacher was preaching. And then as he was preaching, he said, do you know where we would have been now? If um, Eve had not committed sin, and then he replied, we would all have been in the Garden of Eden. And this is a person who has gone to seminary, and he's been preaching for a long time. And um, in his own church, he has uh, more than 10,000 people. And in that camp meeting, they had more than 20,000. And he said, if Eve had not committed sin, that all the human race would have been in the Garden of Eden now. Then I picked up my Bible. And I started to check up, is that statement correct? Is it right or is it wrong? Then I discovered that in Genesis chapter 1, verse um, 28. And God blessed them. And God said unto them, be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth and replenish the earth that is fill up the earth and subdue it so we were not supposed to remain forever in the garden of eden even if adam and eve had never sinned and you know i used to think that um, well i don't know who taught me this but i don't know whether you have been taught to they said that if it were not for eve that committed sin oh my there will be no work at all you want to take um, a basket of yam to, uh, the, to the place, that's to your house. You put the basket of yam down. You take a whip and whip that basket of yam. And the basket of yam will just be going and going and going. But you see now where we have to carry the basket of yam on our head because Eve and Adam committed sin. Some of you heard that before? Yes. But that's a lie. So we are told here he planted the garden of Eden just for these two at present because they were not too many. And then he told them what they must do. He gave them a commandment. Now listen to verse 9. And out of the ground made the Lord God to grow every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. And the tree of life also in the midst of the garden and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Then in verse 15, and the Lord God took the man and put him into the garden of Eden to dress it and to keep it. That is work. We are not created to be lazy. To dress it, to dress it, to keep it clean, to keep it tidy, and to keep it, to keep every intruder out of that garden. And to keep that garden good. If God has given you a family, he wants you to dress and to keep that family. If God has given you a work, he wants you to dress and keep that work. If God has given you a church to pastor, the work of God to do, he wants you to keep and to dress it. He doesn't want us to be lazy anything we're doing. He doesn't want us to just um, uh, lie there and uh, just wish that uh, the days of work will all be over. No, he wants those who are Christians to be up and doing spiritually we must not be lazy physically we must not be lazy and the lord god commanded the man saying of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat but of the tree of the knowledge of knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat for in the day that thou eatest thereof 
thou shalt surely die. God is love, but God is a God of holiness. Look at how much God loved Adam and Eve. He planted the garden of Eden for them. He took care of them very well, but he gave them a commandment. You cannot sustain any relationship or fellowship with God without commandments. Those who say, well, I am saved and I have no commandment to keep. There is this commandment, love your brother, love your sister as Christ has loved you. That's a great commandment and it will take a lifetime to be able to obey that. Forgive everyone that has offended you 70 times, 7 times. That is a commandment and no matter which church fellowship you attend, uh, which denomination you fellowship with, that commandment you will have to obey. Because constantly you'll find the opportunity, you'll discover there is everyday opportunity to obey that commandment. And God has not changed. Has God changed? And then from verse 18. And the Lord God said, It is not good that the man should be alone. I will make and help meet for him. And out of the ground of out of the ground, the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every fowl of the air, and brought them unto Adam to see what he would call them. And whatsoever Adam called every living creature, that was the name thereof. And Adam gave names to all cattle, and to the fowls of the air, and to every beast of the field. But for Adam there was not found and help meet for him. And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam, and he slept. And he took one of his ribs, and closed up the flesh instead thereof. And the rib, which the Lord God had made, had taken from the man, made he a woman, and brought her unto the man. And Adam said, This is now bone of my bones. And whenever your bone is dislocated, you know how much, how much pain you feel. Whenever there is an accident and your bone has to be uh, cut or a plaster has to be placed on your bone, you know uh, how it disfigures you. That's what happens when you cut your wife away. This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore shall a boy leave his father. These boys who are running away from home, running to meet girlfriends, they are out of God's order. They are living contrary to the word of God. These boys who are smoking Indian hair, overdosing themselves, who are drug addicts, and they are telling their fathers and mothers to get away. They don't want anything to do with their father. They say they want to leave home and be free. They are looking for freedom. They are not children of God. They need to repent. Therefore shall a man, a man, leave his father and his mother. A question you might have asked before. I think I asked this question when I was in secondary school. I was interested to know, when do you become a man? Because I discovered that when you are a boy, people push you around. And then you have to uh, get under school regulation. And I wanted to become a man so that as a man I'll be independent. So when does a person become a man? When he is able financially, physically, emotionally, spiritually to live depending upon father and mother. And you are the judge. If at your age, you may be 26, you may be 24, whether you are a man yet. You can't pay your house rent without your father and your mother. Are you a man? You can't find breakfast for yourself without your father and your mother. Are you a man? You can't handle a small problem. Somebody has offended you. You'll weep and run to daddy and to mommy. Are you a man? 
you become a man when you are able, capable, spiritually, emotionally, physically, materially, capable to leave your father and your mother and to live with another person and to be in control. So verse 24, Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother and shall cleave unto his wife and they shall be one flesh and they were both naked the man and his wife and were not ashamed from that first marriage we want to draw seven lessons scriptural lessons on marriage one marriage is for companionship ecclesiastes 4 9 to 12 tell us that two are better than one because if one falls, the other will lift him up. First Corinthians chapter 7, verses 3 to 5 says uh, that we must not defraud one the other, that the man does not belong to himself, I'm paraphrasing it in my words, and the woman does not belong to herself, that the wife belongs to the husband and the husband belongs to the wife. And in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 33, we are told that so ought every man to love his wife and the wife sees that she reverence her husband so the first lesson we learn from this is marriage is for companionship for god said in verse 18 that it is not good that the man should be alone and god decided and determined and he made the plan and carried it out that i will make him and help suitable for him meet for him brother listen not every woman is suitable for you as wife. There is something that is called compatibility. That is, you can act alike, live together. There will be less friction when you are compatible. She will be joyful in your presence and you will be happy in her presence. You'll be happy you have married her. You'll not be looking out to another woman. She'll be happy she has married you and she'll not be looking out to another man. So marriage is for companionship. Again, we discover that animals cannot minister comfort, fellowship, and love to man. We are not supposed to marry animals. Because all the animals were brought to Adam. And um, Adam could not find anyone suitable for comfort, for companionship, for fellowship, for love. We are not supposed to talk to animals. If you are in a cult and uh, you discuss and converse with animals and have fellowship with animals and you are friendly with an animal more than with man, with a man like yourself, woman like yourself, you are out of God's order. And we're not supposed to have any moral sin with an animal. Then the rib taken near the heart of man became the wife. And that was God who made that rib to be man's wife. That rib taken out of the rib near the heart, not in the leg, to teach you a lesson that we're not supposed to trample upon the lady. Believers have forgotten that we are to trample upon serpents and scorpions. But our wives are not serpents and scorpions, are they? No. Is your wife a serpent? No. Is she a scorpion? No. We are to trample over the enemy, over the devil. But your wife is not the devil. You are to love your wife. Love your wife. Love your wife. The Bible says, he that loveth his wife, loveth his own self, or his flesh. And no man ever yet, yet hateth his own flesh. And then, number four, a man can only marry when he's capable, spiritually, capable, physically, capable, emotionally, capable, materially, of leaving his father and his mother. And the Bible teaches that when Rebecca was to be married unto Isaac, this question was asked, 
Will you go with the man? She said, I will go. And she left. And until you can leave father and mother and you can handle your problems personally with the help of God, with the knowledge of the word of God, you are not ready for marriage. Only one wife was given by God to Adam. That's interesting. Only one wife. And you know at that time, if anybody ever needed two wives, ten wives, a thousand wives, I believe Adam was in the best position to have that. Because there was so much loneliness in the world at that time. You picture the whole of Lagos with only you, a man. Well, you are, you are living in one single room and you feel so lonely and you want to marry. Am I right? Well, then you picture Adam in the whole world while well, he was lonely. And God did not give him two wives, three wives, ten wives, just one. Any other thing more than that is covetousness. If you marry another person, God has not given her to you. You have just stolen her. God gave only one wife unto Adam when he could have tried to give two or ten. God made no provision for divorce and remarriage. Because God gave him only one and did not create another woman hiding in a corner saying, Adam, come here. That is Eve. But uh, human beings are human beings. Should in case anything can happen. Should in case Eve offends, like she may decide to eat the fruit of the tree. Or you may send her to do some work. She may not be submissive enough. Should in case anything happens between you and Eve and you want to marry another person, here is another person. Don't marry her yet. If Eve has a problem with you, kick her out and then you can get this one. Or if uh, God did not create that person, God could have said, if Eve happens to make a mistake, commit a sin, or trespass, make an error, I'll make another person. No, God did not give the provision for remarriage, for divorce. It is only death that separates husband and wife. And it says, uh, the word of God says, they were in the presence of one another and they were not ashamed. Now that's more than physical. There are husbands who are ashamed to reveal to their wives that they do not have enough time with God, quiet time. Oh no, they will not tell their wives their secrets. If they're weak spiritually, they feel ashamed with uh, the sister, with the wife, they dare not talk. They say, if I tell her everything about myself, she will uh, know too much about me. And I, I don't want to do that. I don't want to do that. And there are women who will not tell all their mind to their, to their husbands. They can't say, well, this is the problem. Because they feel, if I tell him too much about myself, I'll be ashamed. But they were together and they were not ashamed in the presence of one another. Well, if you are hiding your bank account from your wife, you are not one. You are not together. You are living out of God's order. If you side your father and your mother against your wife, you are not in Bible order. Let's go back to Genesis chapter 1 and um, in two, three minutes, just get something out here. Verse 26, and God said, let us make man in our image and after our likeness. It is good news to know that we are not made after the likeness of Satan. We are made after the likeness of God. True, Adam and Eve lost that image. But now that we are born again, again we have dominion over all things. Because in Ephesians chapter 1, let us quickly refer to that. Ephesians chapter 1. For those of us who have been studying the Bible, we know that we are kings reigning in life by Christ Jesus. You have discovered that God made enough sufficient provision for Adam and Eve. 
and today my God, your God, and the God of our Lord Jesus Christ shall supply all your needs according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. Amen. The word of God says, I wish, I pray, I desire above all things that ye prosper and that you be in health and you prosper as your soul prospereth. The psalmist tells us, I have been young now, I am old. I have not seen the righteous forsaken or his children begging bread. He is still supplying all our need today. And the Lord Jesus Christ told us in so many words in Matthew chapter 6, from verse 25, saying, um, Take no thought what ye what shall eat, or what ye shall drink, or what wherewithal shall ye be clothed. He said, It's not meat more than raiment, and it's not um, the body more than, uh, more than clothes. He said that if we seek the kingdom of God and its righteousness, all these things shall be added unto us in Ephesians chapter 1 we are placed in authority and dominion over all the creation of God and in fact now over all evil spirits this is a privilege and you dare not allow anybody uh, to take this confidence away from you Ephesians chapter 1 from verse 21 Far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this world, but also in that which is to come, and has put all things under his feet and gave him to be the head over all things to the church, which is his body. And the fullness of him that filleth all in all. Ephesians chapter 2 verse 4 to verse 6. But God, who is rich in mercy, for his great love, wherewith he loved us. Does God love you? Yes. Does God actually love you? Yes. Does God really love you? Yes. I'm glad we know he loves us. Even when we were dead in sins, has quickened us together with Christ by grace ye are saved and has raised us up. Are we down or up? up? That's far above all principality and power. Far above. He has raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, what is the purpose? So that in ages, in the ages to come, he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. He has made us kings and priests. He has made us to reign. Let's end up with Luke chapter 10. From verse 17. This is part of the truth every believer ought to know. Luke 10, from verse 17. And the 70 returned again with joy, saying, Lord, even the devils are subject unto us through thy name when you have the name of Jesus. All evil spirits are subject unto you through that name. Amen. And he said unto, he, unto them, I beheld Satan as lightning fall from heaven. Satan has fallen, yes. but we are raised up. Yes. Satan is down, yes. but we are up. Yes. We are the one ruling. We are the one having dominion over sin. Some people only think that we have dominion over sickness. And the only thing they talk about is healing, healing, healing. But we have dominion over sin, over Satan, and over sickness. It's complete victory that we have. And in verse 19, Behold, I give unto you power to tread on serpents, not power to tread on your pastor. Some of us didn't know that. 
Not power to tread upon the Bible study leader. No. Let's get this thing straight. Power to tread upon serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, not over the word of God. You don't trample on the word of God. That word of God is still above us. Because God has exalted his word even above his name. And if we're not going to trample over or if we're not going to trample on the name of God, we must not trample on the word of God. But he says, I've given you power to tread upon serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy and nothing shall by any means hurt you. Say, nothing shall by any means hurt me. Nothing shall by any means hurt me. Not withstanding. In this rejoice not, that the spirits are subject unto you, but rather rejoice because your names are written in heaven. That's what I want you to go home with. Your names are written in heaven. If you are a saved soul, if you are a child of God, your name is not in the book of men here on earth. All those books will be born one, uh, one of these days. But your names are written in the book of life in heaven. If your name is not written there yet, you can repent, confess, and forsake your sins and call upon the name of the Lord. And whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Let us pray. Christ Jesus. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. God is with you. He will not leave you alone. His name is Emmanuel. God be with us. Remember, if you are married, marriage is for companionship. It is not the will of God to be living separately. Marriage is for companionship. Do you have true companionship with your wife or your husband? Is your wife near your heart, precious and dear to you? If you are married, are you, have you left father and mother? Or are you still depending on father and mother? Do you know that God's perfect will is that you are married to only one wife and only one husband? And God has not made any provision for you to divorce or to remarry. name we pray. Amen. Great and mighty God, our Father and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, we thank you because of the teaching of your word. We thank you because of all that we have learned and known tonight. Father, we pray that this word will prosper in our lives. Amen. We pray that this word will take root, will make us to grow will make us to develop Amen. and father will be giants in faith and giants in holiness Amen. giants in accomplishing what you want us to accomplish Amen. father we pray that every one of us as we listen to your word will do your perfect will every day of our lives Amen. we pray that ignorance will be swept away by the knowledge of truth Amen. that the truth will find a place in every one of our hearts Amen. as we reach out to other people as we compel them to come in, as we plead with them, as we invite them, Father, we pray, as they come in here, they'll be saved. Amen. As they come in here, they'll be provided for. Amen. As they come in here, they'll be, they'll be healed. Amen. And Father, we pray that whatever problem anybody brought here today, 
In the name of Jesus, we command that all those students will go away in Jesus' name. From tonight, we pray that every child of God will come to the rightful position you have placed us, Amen. having dominion Amen. over all things, Amen. and sin, evil, immorality, or iniquity will never have dominion over us. Amen. That every one of us, by the power of the Holy Ghost, by the power and the blood of Jesus, will reign and rule and be in control and never be intimidated never be made afraid by anything anybody any man or animal but will be bold as a lion everywhere we go father help us to realize our position as kings talk in authority act in authority pray in authority Help us every day to live right. Amen. That all that we do will be holiness unto the Lord. Amen. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.